Thank you. So our fifth and final speaker of the session is Professor Ara Dazi. Uh, thank you. Could I thank the organisers for inviting me? And you probably will see from the title of the talk, I'm a surgeon, but I have to admit in the presence of this august audience, I'm also a failed engineer and a failed policymaker. And interestingly enough, the organisers have asked me to speak about engineering and surgery and policymaking. So I will try my best. Uh, over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. I think it's worthwhile to start off with and, and recognizing the contribution that engineering has made in healthcare. And look at the last century, some of the major advances, some of the major discoveries that has really doubled the life expectancy of mankind. Now you think of any other sector who has contributed to humanity to such a degree, doubling the life expectancy a phenomenal achievement. Engineering had a huge role to play and I could confidently tell you over the last 50 years 40% of the major breakthroughs in engineering and really the contribution to increasing life expectancy have come from this country. It's also interesting to point out to you that the beginning of that century every family was spending the twice amount of money on funerals than they were on health care. Towards the end of that century, we're near enough spending 8.3% of our GDP on healthcare in the UK. And if you cross the Atlantic, they are a complete basket case. They're spending 19% of their expenditure on healthcare. And it's fascinating to see the return on that investment. So, what are the challenges facing us if you are a policymaker? If you're an engineer here, there are some young people here. What are the big inventions that we need to think of in the future? The landscape is changing. Very eloquently described, the burden of disease is not just increasing, but it's also changing. Lifestyle diseases. Who would have predicted three decades ago we'd be talking about an epidemic in obesity? Patients' expectations are changing. We always blame politicians in increasing patient expectations. 1948, when the NHS was created, it was a post-war I need generation. We're dealing with the generation, iPod generation now. I can and I want. And that's a very different way of managing such patients. Rising unit costs. There's something about innovation in healthcare. For some reason, in the minds of policymakers, it seems to add cost, where innovation in any other sector improves quality, improves access, and reduces cost. I'll tell you why. We're very good in commissioning new services, new technologies in healthcare. We are terrible in decommissioning the old stuff. There's always some surgeon who wants to do something differently, or the old way, and that's the way, and that is a challenge. So what is innovation? I think it's important to recognize not just the technological innovation that we see on the back of engineering, but the huge amount of process engineering that has huge impact in saving more lives in this world, and I'm going to share with you some examples. Firstly, let me start with my own uh, work. I happen to work in Imperial, extremely fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, working with very, very, very clever engineers and scientists. A few of them are in this room. I see the kidney there. I can see Guang Zongyang, who's my partner in crime for the last decade. Most of our work has been in devices, gizmos. I'm the gizmo man. I actually take these gizmos in the operating theater and see what I could do. And the biggest revolution in my career has been reducing the physical and psychological trauma of surgery. In the old days, I was maximally invasive surgeon. The bigger the incision, the more macho, the better surgeon I was. I am a now a miniature surgeon. I'm a minimally invasive surgeon. I do tiny incisions to make patients get out of there quicker. And what, have, what we've done back to the last century we, technology has added years to our lives. The big challenge we have in surgery now, how do we add life to these years? In other words, how do we improve the quality of life after surgery? The use of data. We have wealth of preoperative data. Imaging, CT scans, MRIs, wealth of data. Only used for diagnostic purposes. Why don't we use that data during a surgical procedure? To enhance the ability of a surgeon to do a more accurate a more precise procedure. Why don't we use post-operative monitoring using sensing technologies that are available? There are more sensors in a Formula One driver uh, car than there is, for example, in a post-operative patient in intensive care. How could we translate some of that innovation into the management of the extremely sick patient? And 
Our work has been mostly based on the use of the three attributes of a surgeon, although most would not believe there is a cognitive element to surgery, uh, but there is. Uh, there is a perceptual element, obviously, and there is the motor control, and this is me doing laparoscopic or keyhole surgery. And the ability to use that data set, in this case, in image augmentation during the operation. Could we, for example, superimpose the tumor, a tiny tumor, in the ear of screening in a very large solid organ and do a segmental resection rather than a major resection? Is really what's driving this type of work. Could we identify prostate uh, during a radical prostatectomy, the hypogastric nerve? in not just curing a patient from cancer at a young age, but not rendering them incompetent and impotent after an operation. That is where improving the quality of surgery is going. One of the major iatrogenic injury to your brain during a cardio coronary artery bypass graft is not the operation. It's when you put the patient on a heart and lung bypass. A massive engineering discovery revolutionized uh, uh, coronary artery vas vascular vascularization. However, we've also discovered it does some funny things to your brain for the first eight weeks after the operation. So the challenge was, could you do this operation without putting the heart on a heart and lung bypass machine? And this is one of the main drivers funded by EPSRC. Uh, and, the, and the concept was to use the case contingent motion stabilization technology. In other words, measuring the depth of the tissue. If you know the tissue characteristics, could we move the scope at the same rate as the beating heart and display to the surgeon a static image? And at the same time, waking up the nieces because that is when they wake up, when the heart stops. In actual fact, the heart hasn't stopped. You are fooling the system and you're displaying to the surgeon a static image. Could you, for example, introduce safety zones into the... Into the we are all human. Error is human. The ability of a surgeon to control their, if you like, the safety zone during that operative procedure. In this case, again, a radical prostatectomy, a funnel-shaped space in the green space in which the surgeon cannot operate above and beyond what we call the gaze contingent haptic constraint or a force feedback. I love to create force feedback in Parliament with politicians to prevent them going sideways. That is the type, that is the type of safety technology. And let's not forget, in the era of safety, uh, and this is a uh, publication from the Institute of Medicine, very, very eloquently, the number of patients, the death rates from avoidable deaths is equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every three days. That is a well-known fact, and we are, in this country, going through an interesting phase at the moment with a, one of our major, uh, one of our uh, providers who has been seriously impacted by safety issues. So, what is surgery is all about? This is Langebusch. This is the 100 years ago, doing a gallbladder operation through a big open incision, big macho incision. This is keyhole era, where we're going to next is using natural orifice to gain access to either the abdominal cavity or the chest cavity to do a surgical procedure. So-called incision-less surgery. You know, that's a paradox in itself, incision-less surgery. So, it's not just about gizmos. I'm always described the, as the low-impact, high-cost surgeon. It's about process innovation, too. And let's bring that back. Simple stuff that we can borrow from the engineering sciences, manufacturing, back to the 1940s. Very few of this has translated into healthcare. A simple surgical safety checklist. 19 indicators, evidence-based. We know they all work. If you give their patients antibiotics 20 minutes before you make an incision, the wound infection rate drops by about 30%. If you make sure you check with the nurse and the anesthetist which site you're doing the operation, wrong site surgery drops com completely. 19 indicators. You laugh. Look at the baseline, look at the checklist data. This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Simple process innovation. I would love every medical student or a postgraduate surgical student to do an engineering course for six weeks to learn about the skills of process engineering. I would love every doctor who's hand on, handing over a patient to another doctor to go to an engineering school to learn the skills of handing over something in a pipeline or a chain. And that is, that is a reasonable example. Now, I think we heard this beautifully touching talk about the developing world, but there's also something very exciting happening in that part of the world. And mostly, not, we call them emerging economies. They're actually emerged. They're well emerged now. 
where we are. And this is a piece of work that I had the fortune of leading policy work with the World Economic Forum published in Davos three years ago, and that is looking at innovative delivery models across the globe. And what's unique in this study, some of the major innovations are actually coming from the southern hemisphere and towards east. And we saw some examples of that uh, in the previous speaker. And let's look at India, the Aravind Eye Center. They do 200, nearly a quarter of a million cataracts a year. They make their own lenses, okay? The cost of the procedure is $35, $36. The gross margin rate and the return of capital is greater than Moorfields, which is up the road from here, which is one of our best, best eye hospitals. Now, it's interesting if you look at their principles of innovation. It's all about world-class quality. It's about reducing cost. It's about scaling it and making it affordable. So any PhD student here, we better look east and see what they're doing there. There are amazing innovations that are coming here that we can learn a lot from. On that note, thank you again for your time, and thank you for having me here.